Thank you, man. That was tremendous. I just heard Doris say, how many were singing? Doris is blind. How many are singing? Four. So four men. Thank you, man. That was tremendous. Also great to see four teenagers in the choir this morning. That made my morning as well. So uh, we can hear them in another occasion. But guys, you can sing that every week. That was absolutely fantastic. Well, good to have you here on the Lord's Day. Uh, we are in the book of Matthew, chapter 4. We also are celebrating the Lord's Supper together, which we haven't done in a, a number of months. And with the uh, COVID era we went through, it was very difficult. Uh, one, we weren't even on site for a large portion of that time. And then when we came back, we've also been, you know, rightfully very cautious. And the Lord's Supper is difficult to pass the tray with the bread and the fruit of the vine and so forth. So we do have these little units, and if you've not yet picked one up and want to participate with us at the end of the service, our men will come forward and make sure you have one uh, so you can join us. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, I'd like to preach a message on the cross. Uh, my text will get us there, um, so I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and kind of quickly go through the verses this morning, verses 12 through 17, and then make a, make a beeline to the cross with the, with the message, I, I don't like tacking the Lord's Supper on at the end of a service. I think that's inappropriate. And also, I think it's extremely uh, uh, prudent to, to tie the message in with the Lord's Supper so that they are you know, one and the same. And so we, are, we will get to the cross, but if you've been following us in the mornings in our verse-by-verse -verse study, we are in the book of Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we'll be looking at verses 12 through 17. Let me go the right direction here. The uh, theme we've been talking on has been the fulfillment of Scripture. Matthew is really good at that with explicit statements. We'll have one of those in our paragraph. Often, if there's not an explicit fulfillment of Scripture, there's an allusion to an Old Testament prophecy. So Matthew is trying to persuade his Jewish audience, you know, to us today, uh, to believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, that it's, it's to be relied upon, and that it speaks to the person of Christ. And so uh, this is a, a, a great text that we'll be looking at here in Matthew. But before we go any further, uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time here. Uh, also, it's a good time for each of us to, to quietly pray where we are to the Lord, to ask him to search our heart, to make sure that we're right with him. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's for God's people. It's for God's people who have done good inventory to make sure that they're walking with the Lord, that there's not unconfessed sin in one's life, uh, where we are seeking him and to really make this a meaningful service to worship him, and especially through the hearing of his word and then the celebration of communion together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the singing that we can sing praises to your name. And uh, we think of the, the theme of faith this morning, faith in an object, faith in you. And uh, we are so thankful that our faith in you will bring to us salvation. We, we thank you for the word of God where the Philippian jailer asked Paul what he needed to do to be saved and as what must I do to be saved and Paul responded believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We thank you that you've designed salvation where you've done all the work for us where we just need to repent turn from our sins and place our faith in you and uh, call upon you in faith and you will give to us that gift of everlasting life and we thank you for that. For all of us who are enjoying salvation, enjoying a relationship with you, we pray, Lord, that this service would please you. If there be any sin in our hearts, please cleanse us. If there's something that you need to point out, we pray that the Spirit of God would do so in this service, that we would confess that to you, and by grace, determined by your help to forsake it, to change, to continue to become more like your Son. We thank you for this amazing book, the Bible this revelation of history. Uh, we thank you for the focus, especially on the cross that is given to us in the Gospels. And uh, we pray this morning that we would have time to reflect on that body that was broken for us and that blood that was shed. We now pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage we're going to quickly breeze over um, is a transition point dealing with the right time. In, in every way, Christ was always on schedule. In the fullness of time, he was born. Every step of his life and pathway was always the right time. And uh, we're going to leave the Jordan River now in the life of Christ. And in verse 12, it says, Now when Jesus 
uh, had, had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed, uh, as it will say, say in a moment, to Galilee. So the timing was right. We'll come back to some of that next week, what all that means. Uh, but it's the right time. He's going to transition from the Jordan River to Galilee. Uh, we will see that's the right place. It says, in leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast and the borders of Zabulon and, and Naphtalim. So at the right time, he goes to the right place. Uh, Matthew draws our attention to the right passage as Jesus ministers there to the north of Jerusalem, especially up there in the region known as Galilee, the region of Galilee, it's all of its subset of cities. Uh, Matthew's quick to point out that that ministry in that location uh, was fulfilling a prediction made by the, by the prophet Isaiah some 700 years before. In verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as such as was in their vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Sebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. So Isaiah 9 says when, when the Messiah is here, when he's doing his earthly work, you're going to see him based and operating in the northern part of the country of Israel in this specific region, in these specific cities. And so now all of a sudden, Matthew draws our attention that we have a prophecy and that it was indeed fulfilled, the right passage. It deals with the right people. In verse 16, uh, the people which sat in darkness uh, saw great light, and to them which sat in the region, in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So the ministry of Christ, he's the, he's the Son of God, he's light, God is light. And uh, he's presenting that light of his person, and then his work is being presented to that group of people. While he's there with the right, in the right place at the right time, with the, the right passage, uh, he has uh, the right people in front of him, and then there's the right preaching. Verse 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach, and, and very much like, the, uh, like John the Baptist, he, his message was repentance. The Bible says that he preached in this regard. He said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So a very powerful message. Whatever he's proclaiming, he's calling people to turn from their sin and, uh, and to come to the Lord in faith. Because he, the king, is there, and if he is there, the kingdom obviously is at hand or is near. So no doubt, the right preaching. Now I'd like to just stop there for a moment and pause. We scrambled over that very quickly. But I want to take us to the cross. All the Bible is Christocentric, so it's very easy to, to follow the path of the Scripture. Whatever it may be, it ultimately points to Christ. And so, so far, just in review, in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, we're on a, a trajectory. The book is, is driving us to the cross. And uh, we're going to see that in chapter 26 and 27, um, those type of details. And it's easy to get lost in the details as we walk through, you know, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and all the way up to 26. You know, where's this story going to? And I just want to just make it very clear, the whole story, the bulk of the content in the Gospels is, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So if you do a verse-by-verse -verse comparison as to the, just a sheer bulk of Scripture, uh, in the Gospels, the focus is Christ's death. He was born to die. But looking at these first three chapters, look at this trajectory leading to the cross. Chapter 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So, so his journey, his mission is uh, salvific. It, it is about salvation, about saving people, cleansing us, forgiving us of our, of our problem, which is sin. In the next verse it says, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. And so now we know his mission. He's here to die for us. We know who he is. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. He's God with us. He's Emmanuel. We then turn to chapter 2, and this trajectory to the work of Christ is being just hinted towards. Here we have the Magi, the wise men, they come to Jesus, this newly born one, this babe in a manger, and they fell down and worshipped him. They presented him unto him gifts. Notice the three gifts, each is significant. Gold represents deity. 
They're acknowledging the value of this child. He is God with us. He is Emmanuel. It's appropriate to give the king of glory gold. They gave him gold. Then they gave him frankincense. If you're familiar with the Old Testament system of worship, it was through sacrifices. And frankincense was used. It was burned in the sacrifices. And so this gift foreshadowed the work of Christ, his death. Myrrh was used in the burial of individuals. So that third gift is really foreshadowing his, his, his death. So he's going to die in a sacrificial way. He's going to be buried. And we know from the, from the scriptures he rose the third day. And so even in the gifts, it's foreshadowing this projectory of the cross. The message of John the Baptist, repent ye. The message of Jesus, repent ye. Bring forth therefore fruits meet or necessary for repentance. If you're saying you're repenting, then there should be changes in your life. These which followed the message of John were baptized. Even Christ himself, to fulfill all righteousness, was baptized. As I shared when we went over that passage, when Christ was baptized, he went into the Jordan River, he was buried into the waters and brought up out of the waters, and uh, it was picturing his very mission. He came to, to die, to be buried, and to be raised from the grave. So at the very onset of his public ministry, he's foreshadowing through this act of obedience his work, the work of the cross. And so there is the right trajectory of the cross. Let's talk about the cross. Uh, this morning we're going to do a, kind of an overview of the Gospels uh, to lead us into the celebration of the Lord's Supper. We're going to study just one day in history, the most important day in, in, in all of time. It happens to be in our, 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 our Roman calendar, the date of April 7th, the 30th year. We're going to study it for 24 hours. We're going to start Thursday. If you're a Jew, your, night, your day begins at night after the setting of the sun. So a Jewish day would be from 6 p.m. on one day to 6 p.m. the next day for a total of 24 hours. We work off of midnight, as you know. But we're going to look at these 24 hours. And we're going to start at 6 o'clock Thursday night. And we're just going to trace the life of Christ for just 24 hours, the most significant 24 hours. And so let's begin. At 6 p.m. Thursday, April 6, 30 A.D., the scriptures say, in Mark 14, and in the evening, Thursday night, he comes with the twelve, and as they sat and did eat, the Bible talks about that evening where he brings them together in an upper room. There in that setting, he will spend approximately five hours with his disciples in that upper room. You know, a very famous drawing. It's, it's not accurate for a lot of reasons, but it's a masterpiece for sure and something we can look at. Uh, the seating arrangement was in the form of a triclinium. Certainly that's not a triclinium. That's just a single table, but at least we get the idea there's the Last Supper. The Last Supper is going to be a time in which Christ will celebrate the Passover with his disciples, which was an Old Testament ceremony, a ritual, that foreshadowed the future death of the Messiah, who was to die on the Passover. And so Jesus, being the Lamb of God, uh, very appropriately is taking the teachings, that rich history of the Passover celebration, and here at this Last Supper transitions from the Passover to what we call the Lord's Supper. So under our church dispensation, we are not celebrating the Passover. You're not required to do that. We're not under law. But we do from time to time celebrate what we call the Lord's Supper. And how often should you do it is really relegated to the judgment of local churches. Uh, the Passover celebration was done once a year, so should we do the Lord's Supper once a year uh, to match that in, in its uh, observance? Possibly. Some do it monthly. We do it every other month. Some churches do it weekly. I think whenever you do it, you take it to heart. <laughs> you, you study the Word of God. You, we understand why we're doing it. We're doing it to worship the Lord. We need to understand how we are doing it and the significance of the ways we do it. And I really believe at a time like this, this morning, uh, this is a time to especially focus on the Word of God, to especially focus on Christ, to especially focus on this 24-hour window where he dies for us. But there sometime after 6 p.m. on Thursday night, the day prior to his crucifixion, he's, he's taking the, the Passover, and now he says to them as they were eating, that Passover meal, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it. 
and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, or covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So uh, as best as this may represent what we're looking at here, he takes the bread and he says, this represents my body, which is going to be sacrificed. And uh, we know that this has been misinterpreted over church history. Some say that that bread in this ceremony becomes literally the body of Christ. Some hocus pocus, some magic taking place. Trans substantiation. Some have said, I can't go that far. But maybe some way, mystically, the body of Jesus is combined with the elements of the bread and the fruit of the vine, and that's called consubstantiation. And that's a step away from transubstantiation, but not far enough. The bread just simply is a symbol. It's an object lesson. It represents. It, it causes us to remember that body. And being unleavened bread, it pictures a, you know, leaven in the scripture pictures sin, represents sin. And so the body we're describing here is a body that was perfect, a person who was perfect, who, who gave his body, he gave his all on a cross. And then the wine here from this, this story of the Passover, he says, this is my blood. This represents, symbolizes my blood. And it's very clear from here in other passages that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. So he's teaching them that this, this Lord's Supper, He's going to tell them to do it again and again. 1 Corinthians will reinforce that message that believers through the church age do celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it's a valuable time. It's a sober time, but it's a joyful time. We have salvation in Christ. We've been forgiven. So we're here to rejoice in the work of Christ that was accomplished on the cross. That night, that night, 6, 7, 8 o'clock, certain things he's doing, He's instituting uh, the Lord's Supper here at the Last Supper. We know that he has exposed uh, one in his midst, that there's a traitor here. There's someone who's a rascal, someone who's a rat, someone who's a snake. And the, the disciples are trying to figure out who indeed would that be. And uh, the Lord makes it very clear to Judas, I, I've got your number, and uh, you, you, can, you can go do your dirty work. And the scriptures talk about how Satan entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot. And uh, he went to, to those Jewish authorities and said, I, I've, I've got your man. You've been looking to capture Jesus and, and eradicate him. I've got him. I know where he'll be. And they negotiate, negotiated a deal for 30 pieces of silver, fulfilling a, a scripture of Zechariah's magnitude. And so sure enough, Judas is there, but he is dismissed. He leaves. And so really from 6 to about 11 o'clock, certain things are going on. Jesus has washed their feet. He's taught on a new commandment, that being love. He has taught maybe for the first time the doctrine of the rapture in John 14, verses 1 through 6. So typically when Jesus speaks about the second coming, he's talking about the revelation, about his second coming back to the Mount of Olives to establish his kingdom at the end of the seven years. But here in, first, in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, if you study that alongside of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, it's clear he's talking about something uniquely different. And not to confuse it with the revelation, but he wants them to at least know in seed form, I am coming again, and I go to prepare a house for you, a mansion for you, and I'm going to come again. And he teaches that doctrine to them. Paul will pick up on that theme in 1 Thessalonians 4. He teaches on the true vine. He teaches them how to pray, especially by his example of his high priestly prayer in chapter 17. And then finally, at a little after 9 o'clock on Thursday night, he went forth after they sang one of the Hallel Psalms, and he went forth with his disciples. So a number of hours spent there in the upper room. When they leave the upper room, we know exactly where they went. The Bible is clear. He went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. So uh, if we take the location where Jesus had the Lord's Supper, where we typically understand it to be, it's about a mile and a half hike from that location up to the Garden of Gethsemane on, on the west side of the, of the Mount of Olives. And uh, I've had the joy um, to walk that route. Uh, I've been there a number of times 
And so each time I go to Israel, I try to literally walk each of these steps I'm describing now to you, and I actually have my watch on. I'm saying, okay, how long does it take to go from point A to point B? Just normal walks at 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So I'm factoring all of my own research into these walks and journeys, and I'm going to say that my timing on all these events is not probably, in most cases, precise, unless the Bible says a time, and then it's precise. So my calculations are probably within 15 to 30 minutes of accuracy in all these points. So he's going to walk from this location of the upper room. Uh, they're going to go uphill for about a mile and a half, probably about a 30-minute walk. Uh, the Word of God says here, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his, to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. So basically, here's your route. So Christ is down here. This is the traditional location of the Passover meal. He's on the south side of the city. He's going to walk here down. The Bible tells us across that Kidron Valley. He's right there. He's going to come down, and there's a, there is a path that goes right up to the Garden of Gethsemane. So just a little over a mile from, from here to there, about 20 or so minute walk. On that, on that mount, you have all kinds of olive gardens, olive trees. You have an oil press that's been excavated uh, by archaeologists. So very, very beautiful walk. Uh, we took a group up. We did that walk. We did that walk before our, our regular tour began one morning. I think, Chad, you were with me on this one. I'm trying to think who else was with me. Elise was with me. Who else was with me? Because I did something really bad. Can you imagine that? So uh, we went from here up to here, but our motel was over here, and to get there quick, more quickly, we were running, I was running late, imagine that, uh, running late, we had to go through the Muslim quarter, through the Muslim, there's four different groups of people living in this area, and, and you do not go through the Muslim quarter, you don't go through the Muslim quarter, uh, there, there's issues there, there's issues everywhere, um, so it was a little nerve-wracking there, uh, well, what happened, they, nothing less than being just shot at, machine guns or whatever, maybe, but um, I cut a corner, I cut a corner there, so uh, dogs were barking, people were coming out of their houses, and we just kept moving right, right along. Anyway, beautiful journey. But here's where they went. They went from here, uh, around the corner, I'll just show you what that corner looks like. So that corner, you come around the corner, uh, the trail's over here, they're walking around that corner. You walk by this, uh, they would have walked by that, that was there before Jesus' days. So uh, that's Absalom's tomb, we're going to go right up the walk, right up here. And we're going to look here at the eastern, eastern wall, uh, up, up to Gethsemane. So over here is the garden, but here you look up at the wall. And in the days of Christ, there was a ramp or bridge right from here over to the Mount of Olives. And it's, it's since been destroyed, but that was an interesting ramp that came in through the gate. If you're familiar with Bible prophecy, Jesus will come through the eastern gate at his revelation. Uh, our, our, our Muslim friends are fearful of, of of Jewish Jesus coming. They believe in a, a, a Muslim Jesus uh, who never died. It was Judas on the cross, not Jesus, in their viewpoint. So to keep Messiah from going through the gate, you build it up with bricks. And then they built a cemetery here. And of course, Messiah would never be ceremonially unclean by going or touching those which are dead to go through. So they're trying to jockey away to keep Jesus from coming. But anyway, uh, that night, uh, they get up to, to the Mount of Olives, a beautiful place. It, apparently, Jesus spent a number of nights there. Judas knew that, so Judas is going to make the connection with the people he's working with. And um, Jesus gets there to the Mount of Olives, I, I think, very close to 11 o'clock, very, very close to 11 o'clock. So what happens there in the garden? The Word of God talks about it. Uh, Mark 14, and he comes and finds them sleeping, and said unto, unto Peter, Simon, Sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch for one hour? So Christ was hoping to pray there with his inner three men there, kind of pulled away from the other guys, and uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't stay awake for an hour. And when you study this out, it's been a long day. They just had a big meal. They did walk a mile and a half. It kind of ho hopefully woke them up a little bit, but they're tired. They're all tired. Jesus is tired. He's a man. They're all men. And so at about 11 o'clock, uh, he's hoping for these guys to pray. It's at this point he tells them, he says, you shall all be offended because of me this night. Here's a prophecy in the Old Testament 
Uh, it says, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Of course, when he told the disciples that, Peter arrogantly, arrogantly says, um, they may scatter, but not me. I, I'm willing to die with you. And Jesus, of course, says what to Peter? He says, Peter, by the end of this night, you will betray me three times. You'll hear the rooster crow. Okay. This is uh, the setting in which Judas is going to make the connection. So Judas is working with Jewish authorities, but to arrest Jesus and do his dirty work, he also has to bring in Rome. Uh, so he brings in Roman soldiers. We know that for a fact from the Gospel of John. There's a, a word that is used to describe the men that come uh, to arrest Jesus. Uh, it, it is a word, uh, sometimes it's translated cohort, cohort. So when Jesus is in that garden with 12 other men, uh, coming at him is a cohort. A cohort is one-tenth of a Roman legion. Roman legion is 6,000 soldiers, so 600 men, a cohort, is coming towards Jesus. So when you think of the arrest, do not think, oh man, it's like 12 against 12, 101. This is 50 to 1 odds, 50 to 1 odds. The Romans, when they, when they brought their SWAT team in, they did not mess around. There was no room for error or escape, and so there's no question they're going to assist the Jews in dealing with this religious troublemaker. Rome at this point has no claims to him. He's not offended them as far as they know. But these Jews are really worked up. And uh, to keep peace, they work with the Jews and they come uh, to Jesus. Judas, to make it clear to, the, to that mob, kisses Jesus. Jesus calls him friend. It's a kiss of betrayal. But now the enemy knows which person is Jesus. Some didn't know who, which one of the 13 would be Jesus. Jesus widely, wisely covers for his disciples and allows them to scatter. And uh, that doesn't uh, immediately happen, obviously. There's a little bit of a process there. Uh, swords are being raised. Peter's a hothead. Uh, Peter's going to defend his Savior, his, his, his Messiah. And uh, Peter has a sword, has a sword, and goes after the closest guy to him. His name is Malchuz. And uh, that was a mistake. Malchuz is the high priest's key man, his servant. And really doing the bidding of the high priest. He's right there in the front. And uh, Peter goes for, for him and cuts his ear off at this point. And of course, he wasn't aiming for the ear. Ears are hard to target. <laughs> he was aiming for the neck. And the guy ducked and off goes his ear. And Jesus picks up the bloody ear and puts it back on Malchuz's head and and instantly heals it miraculously and says to Peter and to us, the followers of Jesus, this is not how my work is accomplished. It's not accomplished with a sword. So he's arrested. He's arrested. And you have the Praetorian guard there. Uh, here's a relief from the first century. It gives you a, a really exact idea of how they dressed, uh, some of their ha head attire. And these guys are, these guys are chiseled. They're, they're warriors. Uh, they're, not, they're not looking for a messiah. They're just doing their job, and they do it well. And so they, they basically assist the Jews to, to arrest this Jesus. By the time all of this takes place, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, we're looking at just about, about midnight, about midnight. And as you walk through some of these pictures here, uh, at midnight, the arrest, he's going to be led back from, from Gethsemane, almost back to where the Last Supper took place, to that quadrant of the city, all the wealthy people, lived south and west of the, of the Temple Mount area. So if you study the map of the first century, the wealthy community, the high priests and their families, they're the rich people. The Sadducees were the rich people. And uh, we're going to go back down there uh, to, to Caiaphas' house, almost a mile and a quarter, mile and a half downhill. It'll take 30 or so minutes to get there. Uh, it's during this uh, entourage, this, this march, that a young man pops out of his house near there. He's a rich kid, spoiled kid, and he followed, followed Jesus for a few moments, and then uh, he was going to get drawn into the mess, and he escapes rather embarrassingly, and Mark describes his escape in Mark, Mark 14. Jesus, then the Bible says, is brought to Annas. It's right about 1230, so let's walk down now. Let's walk down the path. So the direction is down that hill, uh, down to Caiaphas' palace, uh, one of the most 
uh, historic places in Jerusalem is the steps that lead up to the palace. That's the original steps on this side here. So Jesus, when he was arrested, is coming down, and then he's going to go up, literally up those steps. So Jesus walks those steps, and when you're over in Israel, everyone's talking about Jesus and where he was. A lot of the place is, is bogus. Or they make it up or they don't know. We do know with, uh, with dogmatism, he walked up those steps. And so he goes up to those steps into Caiaphas's palace. Um, it's a beautiful palace. Uh, the, 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 this is a luxuriant place. And he's going to be brought to the palace. Uh, he's going to be introduced to Annas. Annas is, is the godfather of Israel. He's a bad dude, bad guy. Uh, these, these high priests tragically were being appointed by the Romans themselves. Uh, they put him in office and they took him out of office. And Annas had been in office and then he manipulated it that his son-in-law could be the next high priest. His name is Caiaphas. But the guy calling the shots for the Jewish Sanhedrin, it's Annas. So he's going to be led to Annas and then he's going to be led to Caiaphas. Here's a model of that palace. I mean, that's spectacular. So th this, this is not Motel 6. This is a really serious place. And uh, Jesus is led there, and he's going to be brought before the Jewish authorities. Can you imagine this? We're now at about 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the word goes out, and all 72 members of the Sanhedrin are, are, are being woken up at midnight, 1 o'clock. They're being told, you need to get to Caiaphas' palace right now. I don't care. Uh, just get here as quickly as you can. We, gotta, we got Jesus. We got Jesus, and we need to come to a decision really quickly. We can't make it official tonight. That's a kangaroo court. It's against Jewish law. But we need everyone's consensus. And we got him. We finally got Jesus. And so um, they, they bring him uh, there. And the, the Sanhedrin members are starting to, to work their way to this location. Some are out of town, so they're not all there. But you have a large, large you have a quorum. You have a quorum uh, there that evening. Now, in addition to this, we have Peter and others uh, who are kind of creeping down that same road in, in the shadows, you could say, and they want to see what happens to Jesus. What's going to happen next? And so they, they're, they're following. Uh, Peter and the Apostle John have connections. John in particular has connections with influ influential people there in the city and Jewish leaders. And so they're able to get into the courtyard of Caiaphas. So they're, they're not inside the palace, but they're right outside of it. And the palace is above them, so you have a little bit of elevation. Uh, the Sanhedrin is going to meet in a building right here. It has a walkway that adjoins the, the, the residential place of Caiaphas. So they're going to meet in this one section of the palace with the Jewish Supreme Court. They will, they will get in a half circle around Jesus. They're going to bring in witnesses to try to trump up charges to, to, to get him under some charge. They need two or three people to agree in their stories. They struggle to get that to happen. It doesn't happen. Frustration, you know, is, is taking place. Peter's outside. They're eagerly wondering, what are they going to do with Jesus? And while Jesus is, is there, uh, a little, uh, one of the workers sees Peter and says, I've seen you. <laughs> I've seen you. You're one of those followers of Jesus. And, and, and Peter, you know, Peter is a Galilean. Uh, they're a little bit redneck, a little bit. They're a little more country people. They talk differently than the city people. And he talks, and they know he's not from around there. And he denies it. He denies it for the first time. He denies it. And the rooster crows, probably around 1.30 a.m., the first crow uh, of a rooster. Does Peter connect with it? Probably not. It, the whole thing's overwhelming. Very intense. So at 1.30... 1 o'clock, you have now a, a trial that takes place. And as you do the math and try to, try to project how long do these things take place, uh, I'm looking at about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, the Sanhedrin has gathered. They're trying to, to wrap this deal up to, to execute Jesus. It is complicated for a number of reasons. And they can't get the witnesses to agree. They can't get Jesus to stumble into some confession. So the high priest, out of total frustration, just comes right to Jesus and just says to him, Are you, you're under oath, Jesus, are you the Son of God? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus quotes Daniel 7, verse 13, which is a messianic passage 
that says the Messiah will come and he will govern and judge the nations. So Jesus, in essence, is saying what? Under oath, he is saying, I am the Messiah. He uses the phrase, at least in the Greek, it says, ego, a me. He says emphatically, I am. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, when Moses asked God, who should I tell sent me? God said, tell them the I am sent you. Jesus is claiming under oath to be God. He is claiming under oath to be Messiah. And as soon as he quotes that text, the place goes ballistic. Everyone loses control. The priest is ripping his garments. I mean, they're spitting mad. Uh, we don't need to go any further. He is, he's claimed to be God, and obviously he is not. He is not Messiah. And so the religious charge is blasphemy. Blasphemy. And they all agree to it. They all agree to it. There may be a guy that doesn't fully consent, and he'll come out later. His name is Joseph of Arimathea. Doesn't fully go along with this stuff. He's weighing it out. But on the most part, the, the political religious party of Israel says he needs to be executed. Here's the problem. They're under Roman law. They can't stone. They can't execute anyone. Uh, the Romans have to do that. And the Romans could care less about some detail about Jewish law and Jewish ceremony. So they're going to have to change the narrative a little bit. They're going to have to twist the narrative to get off of a religious charge and get onto a political charge, but that's no problem for them. They got that worked out. And so um, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, they finally come to this conclusion, he is a blasphemer, we have the evidence we need by his own confession. And they leave that part of the palace complex, leaving that building, walking across a little bridge-like and if you're on that bridge, the courtyard is right below it. Who's in the courtyard? It's, it's, it's Peter. And Jesus has just been beat up and buffeted and spit on, and now they're leading him out of that building over to the other part of the palace because at the bottom part of the palace is a cistern, which they're going to use for a prison for Jesus that night. And as Jesus comes out, uh, Peter is denying you know, again and again <laughs> uh, that he even knows Jesus. And he curses. It's not like he's using cuss words. He is saying, I swear to God, I don't know who Jesus is. I'm willing to die according to my promise and oath here. I don't know the man. And as he says that and denies the Lord, the Lord walks right across the bridge being led. And the Bible says, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. The timing's incredible. And Peter saw the eyes of Jesus, just destroyed them. The Bible says Peter went out, went out of the courtyard, uncontrollably wept. Just as the Lord had said he would deny him three times that night, he never thought he would. But now he has. So this would have been the view Jesus would have had right through the courtyard, that upper part of the courtyard. So now we're at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Jesus ate earlier that evening, 7, 8 o'clock, Last Supper. It's been a long day for everyone. It's now 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, here's the problem the Jews now have. What they agreed on, he's a blasphemer, was done at night. Jewish law, you cannot make a judgment call during night. You have to wait for business hours. Sunrise. So they basically said, we'll just keep Jesus in holding here. We'll wait to the morning. When morning comes, we'll gather together and we'll make it, we'll make it legal. We'll certify our decision then. We will, we'll make it law, legal law that he is a blasphemer. And we'll turn him over to the Romans. So Jesus um, was here down this abyss, lower down into it. I have spoken here. I, I've actually read these very verses we're talking about right here from Psalm 88, which is prophecy regarding that night with Jesus in the cistern. Interesting labyrinth to get down there, limestone for our geologists. Uh, but all the way down, they, they place him. He's there for, for several hours. Probably about 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, he's placed in that cistern. At 5 o'clock that morning, when you do the, the study of, of the rising of the sun, we, can, we know exactly in the year 30 AD when the sun rose. You can do this today with the technology we have. On this particular day in history, the sunrise in Israel is 5 40 a.m. So they're waiting. The Jews, probably none of them slept that night. Uh, but at 540, 
Uh, they're going to meet back upstairs in that meeting room where they condemned Jesus. They're all going to rally, rendezvous there, maybe stay there all night. Maybe those servants gave them a meal. Who knows? But they're there. And after 540, Jesus faces the Sanhedrin, piece of cake, it's a done deal. The motion is made. The second is given. And the, and the Supreme Court of Israel condemns Jesus. He's not God. He's not Messiah. He's worthy of death. And we'll turn him over to the Romans. We'll turn him over to the Romans. And so very, very, very interesting. So what do they do? What do they do? They're going to lead Jesus from Caiaphas's palace up to the Temple Mount and they're going to go to the fortress Antonia. So this is embarrassing if you're a Jew in the first century. You, do you see this building here? That's the fortress Antonia, about the size of a football field and a half or two, width of one. So that's a Roman fort. Thank Herod for this. It has walkways, rampways that come off the fort. So here's how it works in the first century. Jews do not have freedom. They're under the thumb of Rome. And that's the Temple Mount here to the left. This is part of the outer courtyard here. And they know if Israel's going to have a problem against Rome, if they ever rendezvous, pull together, and come out fighting, it's going to start right there. That'll be the epicenter. So the Romans said, you know what? We will build our fort above them, and we'll watch all their monkey business. And if we see any issues that we need to curtail, we'll come flying out of our building, out of the fortress, down the ramps with our horses, and we'll take care of business really quick. So here in the morning, uh, a little after 5.40, it takes just a few minutes to wrap up business for the Sanhedrin, and now they're leading, they're leading Jesus to the Praetorium. Uh, when you go there, there are, there are multiple levels, <laughs> uh, archaeological levels being dug. Uh, this, is, this is the original walk uh, in the Praetorium. So again, Jesus walked on that walked on that so uh, Jesus is led there to 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 the Roman fort um, they work very early most Roman governors like to play golf in the afternoon and they start their mornings really early and they're a little nervous Passover if there's going to be a war with the Jews it's when they all come into town at the three Jewish feasts so they're a little anxious and this Passover they're really anxious because they hear there's some internal struggles with the Jews over this person called Jesus so they're on high alert. And they knew Jesus was arrested the night before, and they probably knew he's going to probably be circulated to them in the morning. So Jesus is brought there to the fort. And they're going to give him over to, to the governor, to the governor, Pontius Pilate. I would say between 6.10 and, and, and 6.30. So between 6.10, 6.30, Pilate now faces the king of the universe. And uh, just for your fun, go back to the Gospels and read about that encounter. Insert his wife coming into the mix saying, Honey, I had this nightmare last night about this man. Let him go. This is not going to turn out well. Whatever, honey. So he's there. And while he's there, Pilate doesn't know what to do. He doesn't see any sin in this guy. He doesn't see a threat. And then he hears that this Jesus... This goes back to our passage I read initially in Matthew 4, that he was a Galilean. And as soon as he heard he was a Galilean, he said, <laughs> oh, that's perfect, a Galilean. Hmm. He says, well, I hate his guts. His name is Herod, Antipas. I hate his guts. But you know what? We can agree on this, our equal hatred for Jesus. And Herod's a tetrarch up there. That's his, that's his area, realm of, uh, of sovereignty. So I'll just pass him off to Herod. And so what happens is, is Jesus is now led from the fortress and the communication with Pilate uh, to here. These are models in Israel. Again, a spectacular palace. Uh, Herod is there. Pilate's there. So Jesus is brought there. It's not too far. It's a 15, 20-minute walk. I don't think he's there long. Uh, he doesn't say a word. Doesn't say a word. Herod is excited to have this Jesus person there. He heard about the miracles. And he says, hey, put on a show for me. And Jesus doesn't put on a show for Herod. It's like a lamb brought to the, to the slaughter. Uh, he was silent. And Herod just, get this guy out of here. There's, there's no sin. There's nothing. 
get him out of here. Send him back to Pilate. So kind of a hot potato going back and forth. Now, Pilate to Herod, Herod back to Pilate. This all, of course, the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Now we're at least at 7, somewhere between 7 and 7.45. Pilate doesn't like what's happening. He's being played. He knows it. He's watching the Jewish leaders. He knows they're, they're rascals. They know they're jealous of this Jesus. He knows there's nothing wrong with Jesus. There's not a threat here, especially to Rome. And so he throws out a deal. You know, it's our custom to help you guys out. We release someone on this day each year. Here is a terrorist. His name is Barabbas, the son of the father. Do you, you want me to release Barabbas or Jesus, the son of the real father? And the Jewish Sanhedrin and their henchmen are working the crowds to get them to say, crucify him, crucify the Jesus of Nazareth. And so it's out of, out of Pilate's control to try to maybe push it off. He says, why don't we scourge him? Maybe that'll satisfy when we just make him bloody. And so around 745, 730, this time period, um, he, is, he, Jesus, is scourged. And the word of God talks about that. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. So they tie Jesus to a post, and they take the frag fragulum or the flagellum, the, the Roman scourging whip. Look at these. These are examples. Glass, metal, bones. And as you're tied there, they whip his back, and the thing wraps around his torso, shreds everything into pieces. For Jews, they could whip people, but no more than 40 times, 40 minus 1. This isn't a Jewish scourging, this is a Roman scourging. There is no limit. People die when they're scourged. Many die when they're scourged. The Bible says after this scourging and after the crucifixion, if you looked at Jesus, it would be hard, hard to even know if he was a man or a woman. You couldn't tell. So there's no artist and there's no film that can give us the bloody details of what this looks like. This and the execution on the cross. And who would want to try to imitate it? Devastating, devastating. So now here we are. We're in the morning. Good Friday. Here's a beautiful drawing by Raphael. Jesus is given the cross beam. This is what, if, he, if you survive the scourging, the crosses, different, different styles. He had a traditional, we would look at it as a T cross. And they would give the, the, ex, the person being executed the, the, the vertical beam. You would carry that vertical beam, rough wood, bloodied up from previous use, a lot of nail holes. And Jesus is carrying them. He's a man's man. He's a carpenter's son. He, he, he dignifies the work of a blue labor worker. And Jesus gets that thing on his shoulders blood everywhere organs exposed and he takes that cross from from the Antonia fortress which is here and he's going to go right up to the north gate so from here to there that's not much of a walk five minute walk Jesus can't carry that cross for any more than five minutes he'll come to that gate the Damascus gate and there at that gate, he falls under the weight of that cross. He cannot carry it another foot. And uh, of course, just at that time, there were people coming into the gate and people coming out of the gate. And a Cyrenian uh, was asked to pick up the cross for Jesus, commanded to do so. And they're going to walk out that northern gate. They're going to get on the road that leads to Damascus. It's right there, uh, pavement today, 135 miles from that point to, to the capital of Syria. The strategic point of this, this is where they would execute people in the first century. They take you outside of the walls. They take you out on a road like this, especially this road, a lot of traffic. And they're going to go to a, a T in the road. You go right outside that gate, not too many feet. There's a garden down there. Uh, but at that, at that point, the road comes to a T. And one part of the road goes, goes north and east over the Syria, and then part of the road wraps around the city. So there's two roads basically coming into the city that merge there. That's where you put the crosses. That's where you execute people. So it, it gets the most traffic, the most eyesights. You're coming into the city. There's a placard over the person who's being executed telling you what the crime was. The message is clear. You come into this city. You do that crime. This is where it leads. So what is the crime of Jesus on the placard? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, in three different languages. 
And they take him out there. The Bible tells us exactly where they take him. They take him to a place called Golgotha. Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. What's amazing, you can see the skull here. Every time we go, there's more erosion. It was the first time I saw this, just no question, it's a skull. Second time, it's there. Third time, you can see it, not as much. And there at that crossroad, uh, the cross would be put on right next to the road, not high and on a hill. It's a good song. But right next to the road. So when you walk by this ex person executed, you can look him face to face. And so he is, he's going to be put on that cross. You can, do the, you can do the timeline on this. It doesn't take much to get out of the city to get to that location. We're 8, 8.15, 8.30. Uh, we, we are now at the cross. The Roman soldiers, there's four guys assigned to him. There's a quaternion there, but four are assigned to Jesus. Jesus has five pieces of clothing. So each of those soldiers will get one piece that leaves one piece left over who gets the fifth piece there's four soldiers so at the base of the cross these guys are gambling for that seamless garment that Jesus had fulfilling again a prophecy that was made a thousand years before they nail him to the vertical beam they affix it to the, to the horizontal beam and they, they jam it into the ground and stabilize it and when that takes place we know exactly what time that is because the Bible tells us it's the third hour counting, counting from Roman time Time beginning at six in the morning, the third hour. The third hour be uh, nine o'clock. We know exactly. So nine o'clock in the morning, Jesus is on the cross. He'll be on that cross six hours, nine to three. They have parted his clothes. They have offered him a drug, a painkiller. He said I'm, he, he he refused the painkiller, meaning he was going to take all that pain. He would experience every bit of it. He wanted to be thinking clearly. Did not want to be in any way under a drug. He refused it. Later he would take vinegar so he could say a word. His mouth was so dry. And there between 9 and, and 12, there are three things he says. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The, the one of the thieves, one on each side, one will reject Jesus. The other wants to believe in Jesus. And so Jesus says to that repentant thief, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paradise being another word for heaven. You'll be with me in heaven today. And then the apostle John was there at the cross. Most folks were not. Most men were not. John was there with, with, with Jesus' mother, Mary. And John there, uh, Jesus says to John, Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. And basically what Jesus does here, I want you, John, to take care of my, of my mother and get her out of here. And he does. That's between 9 and 12. Standing there by the cross, we know who's there. His mother, his mother's sister, Salome. Mary, the wife of Cleopas. That's the mother of James, the last son of Joseph. And Mary Magdalene are there at the cross. And they stood there until John removed the mother. She would she'd be taken to another location. So the woman who stood by. We now get to noon. Mark 15, 33, when the sixth hour was come, noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. This is eerie. <laughs> it's, it's noon, high noon. And supernaturally, mysteriously, the land is covered in darkness. Eerie silence. The birds stop singing. Everything shuts down. You're the Roman centurion. You've never seen anything like this. It's your job to make sure this execution takes place. If you lose this, you lose your life as a Roman soldier. High alert. What's going on? What's going on? This is, this is an abnormality. And all of nature uh, turned against Jesus at this time. As the weight of sin came upon Jesus, your sin, my sin. When we take the Lord's Supper in a moment, that body that was broken for us, he was the sin bearer. And he, he feel, felt the full weight of your sin, my sin, there on the cross. It's dark for, for three hours. Unbelievable. So one o'clock, it's dark. Two o'clock, it's dark. We now come to three o'clock, and the light now shines forth. Very unusual. And when the switch is turned on, the light switch is turned on, it's the sixth hour was come, the ninth hour was come, 
The word of God says, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Here's the central statement from the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, why have you forsaken me? And the reason was he became sin for you and I. He's the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Cries out. And people heard him say something. Nothing has been said for three hours. Oh, he said something. He said something about Eli, Eli, something. Maybe Elijah's coming. Malachi prophecy. So they ran. They, they gave him filled a sponge of vinegar, and they put it up on a reed up to his mouth, and he could suck on that for a moment and be able to say maybe another word. The Bible's very clear that he's going to say several more things. There's a fifth, sixth, and seventh statement from the cross. The fifth statement, I thirst. They give him that to drink. The sixth statement, it's finished. But he doesn't whisper it. You would expect that for someone drowning on a cross. But with a loud voice, he cries out, it's finished. The Roman centurion, he's never seen this before because when people are executed and die on the cross, they lose strength in their arms and their knees and they basically sag on the cross and they can't breathe out again. They certainly don't speak. It's almost as if this man had control of his very own death. It's almost, I speak as a fool, it's almost as if he was laying down his life when he wanted to. And he chooses three o'clock to do it because at that very moment, at three o'clock on the Passover, there at the temple is when that perfect lamb that was selected, the Passover lamb, was being sacrificed at the very moment. And then he says, finally, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gives up the ghost. It dies. Wow. And here we are today. You know, here we are 2,000 years later. And the, the million-dollar question for us, do we believe this story? I believe every single verse is historically accurate. Every single statement is true. Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. Exactly who he claimed to be. Our response to that, the right response is to repent and believe. To ask Jesus to be our Savior. Lord, I call upon you in faith. Save me. Forgive me. Be, be merciful to me. And if we have called upon him in faith, he's done just that. He's forgiven you. He has saved you. You already belong to him. Yet he doesn't want you to ever forget this day, this day where he paid for your sins on the cross. And so he gives us an, an ordinance, an institution, the Lord's Supper, to, to be able to go through this celebration here, to, to take that piece of bread and say, wow, this is to remind me, so I don't ever forget, this is a, a memory jar, to remember this cross, this cross and what he did. And then we, when we take that fruit of the vine, we say that blood was shed and how it cleanses our sins I don't understand all the details and all the mechanics of that but I believe it what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus and so we drink of the fruit of the vine representing that blood that cleanses us from sin so when I think of the Lord's Supper as we begin in a moment to, to participate this is the backdrop this is the story this is the connection and so I think it would be really good just for a few moments with just each of us with our heads bowed and just take a moment to thank the Lord, to just thank him for dying for you. And if you've never called on the Lord, this is a great time to call on him. Say, I believe it. If you're doubting, I believe, help my unbelief. Trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him. Would you just take a few moments and I'll pray in just a moment. But just thank him. This is a time to thank him for dying for us. Lord, thank you for this morning and to be reminded of what, what it took to pay for our sins. We are so thankful, Lord, you forgave us of all the sins we've committed. And that work on the cross took place, took care of all the sins we will commit. That everything's covered, past, present, future, by the blood of the Lamb. 
we thank you for your son obeying you and doing the will of the Father. We thank you that he submitted his human will when he said, not my will, but your will be done. We're so thankful that he was obedient even unto the death of the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take up the package before us. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. If you do not have one of these units, if you just slip your hand up for a moment, one of our men will make sure you get it one so you can join me here. What you'll want to do once you find yours or have yours, you'll want to take the one side off with the bread and take that out first. If you would just take that off the bottom there, this shorter part. And I would say this for our families online. Uh, we wish you were here with us. It's wonderful to have the family together. Uh, but we are hoping to be able to send these to our, our shut-ins and our, our, our dear friends here and family. Uh, so in the future, you'll have these at home and you can join with us. We think that's extremely important uh, that sense that aspect of the family worshiping our Lord. Does anyone else need one? Do we have them all? I think we're good. <laughs> okay. I think we have... Did everyone get one? Anyone not? Make sure. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, the bread, uh, I have no ability to change this into the literal body of Christ uh, to do so, and then to take it, eat upon it would be cannibalism. We're not going that way. It's a symbol, sim simply a, a reminder. It's a picture of a body that was broken for us. What's amazing, that process broken in the body of Jesus, that's amazing. But it shouldn't amaze us because the Old Testament said he would be crucified, predicted the way he would die, and that there wouldn't be a, bro body, a bone broken. So no surprise. Normally what they would do, uh, the Romans would, um, to accelerate the execution, would typically come and uh, with a, basically a baseball bat in essence and just shatter the legs, just crush the legs of the, of the, of the, of the people being executed. And when their legs get shattered, it drops and they can't breathe and they die quicker. So it was really shocking to, to, to the Romans. They said, Jesus already died at 3 o'clock. This is way early. This, he died. And so what they did, uh, one of the soldiers said, well, we'll make sure, you know. And he took a spear, a, a, a long extended spear, and put it up through his sack, that sack that surrounds the heart, and put that thing up into the heart of Jesus. And that sack, water and blood, just came out. And very, very rep literal, but very representative that he broke, died of a broken heart, died for our sins, but it was very clear that he, he died, he died. And um, the other two guys, they hadn't died yet, and they broke their legs, and they would die quicker, they would die quicker. So his body, you know, it was, it was devastated for us, but it wasn't a broken bone, it wasn't a broken bone. So uh, tremendous physical suffering, but the suffering that took place spiritually was greater. And you always have to keep that perspective. He suffered immeasurably physically. But there on the cross, he suffered spiritually. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt and meant every bit of that. And so for one point in, in time, in eternity, uh, Christ was separated from his Father as he became the sin offering. And he felt it. He tasted sin for us. So when we take and eat here in a moment, please consider these biblical truths and value them and thank them. Let's pray and then we'll take and eat. Lord, thank you for the bread that was broken, that symbolizes the body broken for us. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can think of the cross and the amazing payment that was made. We thank you for, for that body. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let us take and eat in remembrance of him. You could just take a moment and open the cup with the fruit of the vine. The blood that was shed there was amazing, amazing blood. The book of Acts says, the blood of God. Here's God became a man. Blood shed. That blood washed away all of our sins. So when God looks at you and I this morning, he doesn't see a sin on our account. Not one. Not one. He has given to us his righteousness. 
He's imputed it. He's reckoned us perfectly righteous. When he looks at us, he sees the Son, the perfect righteous Son of God. So positionally, we have been forgiven. We have been forgiven because of that shed blood. Let me pray before we take and drink. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son. Thank you for your love for the world. Thank you for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Holy Spirit, thank you for convicting us regenerating us. We thank you for the triune work of God and the great plan of all times, the plan of salvation. We know that your word says that the life is found in the blood. And we thank you for Christ who gave his life blood for us so that we be cleansed from our sin. We thank you for that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take and drink in remembrance of him. When the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper, um, he said to do this in remembrance of him. And before he left that night from the upper room, um, the group would sing. They would sing a very traditional song within their liturgy, a Hallel Psalm. And it was a very significant one they chose. We're going to sing a song I think really summarizes our message this morning, what we've just participated in the wondrous work of the cross. And that's Pastor Nathan to come and close out our service and dismiss us in prayer.